All right, let's do a little review before we get into the next section. So, which level of protein structure consists of peptide bonds? Would this be the primary, the secondary, tertiary, or quaternary? Go ahead and pause the video, think about that. Okay, so remember the peptide bond was the bond that held one amino acid to the next. And then that forms a chain as we have more and more peptide bonds. So that would be the primary structure, right? That's the order of amino acids in the chain. Secondary, remember, was kind of the local folding, small regional folding. Tertiary was the overall folding of the whole protein. And then quaternary was if you have two or more protein chains that are interacting with one another. All right, another review question here. What is the best explanation for the molecular motion occurring in the diagram below? So we have some molecules here and then they are moving to this state here. So is it A, the gray molecules are hydrophilic and do not dissolve in water? Is it B, the gray molecules are hydrophobic and do not dissolve in water? So different term here. Is it C, the gray molecules contain ionic bonds that dissolve in water? Or D, the gray molecules are hydrophilic and repel water molecules? Okay, pause the video, think about that one. All right, so here we have some hydrocarbons surrounded by water molecules. The hydrocarbons have kind of aggregated together because they are hydrophobic and they won't dissolve in water. So remember, these long chains, they're nonpolar, they don't like water, they're hydrophobic, so they all clump together like oil in water. Um, there's no ionic bonds here, uh, they're not dissolving. Um, and here, this is the wrong term, right? Hydrophilic, they would dissolve. Um, and these are basically synonyms of each other. Okay. Hopefully you got that one. In chapter 4.4, we're going to talk about biochemical reactions. Um, we're not going to go too deep into it, but we do need some basic idea of how energy and this process called entropy um, determine how chemical reactions are going to occur, what direction they're going to go in. Then we'll talk about these things called enzymes, which are a special type of protein that are going to do something called catalyzing a reaction. Um, and that's going to influence how quickly reactions can occur. Okay, so at its core, we have this property we call energy. Um, energy is the ability to do work, right? That's not going to work. That's like physics work. Um, changing things, moving things, things like that. And we have these two laws of thermodynamics here. We have the first law that states that matter and energy are neither created nor destroyed. They're just converted between each other. So we take a molecule and we break it apart. We convert some of that into energy, but we're not destroying matter in the process. We're not destroying energy in the process. The second law of thermodynamics states that in all energy transformations, some of that energy becomes unavailable to do work and is lost into this thing we call entropy or disorder. So um, basically this is meaning that we don't destroy matter, we can convert it to energy um, and that work is, it's never 100% efficient. We always lose something here to entropy. Cells are using these principles when they're doing chemical reactions. So in life, we start with some form of usable energy for our purposes. Think of that as food, right? For us, that's organic compounds coming in. There are a set of reactions that are going to occur that are going to take that organic food and transform the energy. Some of that energy is going to be usable. You're going to be able to use that to do work, but some of it is lost to entropy. So there's always loss in these reactions. 
For us, we take the food, we do a series of reactions called oxidation reduction reactions, which we'll come to, and then we convert that into ATP, which is our molecule of energy for the cells, as we saw, adenosine triphosphate. This is never 100% efficient, so you always lose a little bit in this process. This energy transformation happens at a specific rate, and there are various factors that affect that rate. You can think of chemical reactions kind of like a water wheel. We have water that's at a high point up here. Gravity is going to pull it down, spinning the wheel, and it's going to flow down here. So we have our input up here. We would call that our reactants and our chemical formula. And then down here, we have our output or our products. In a chemical reaction, generally we have the reactants over here. We have an arrow that points this way to the products. But sometimes reactions can go in the opposite direction. So if in normal states, we have our reactants, our input level is high, and the level of our products, our output is low, the reaction's gonna move forward in the forward direction here quickly. But if our end products start to build up, like if this water were to start to build up, because I don't know, we blocked it up here, this reaction would start to slow down. And if the level of products gets too high, say it built up to way up here, right? The water was all the way up to here. The reaction might even go backwards at that point. Chemical reactions are just like this. The more you have on either side, the more it's going to push either direction. So if input is high, it's going to flow this way. If uh, products is high, it's going to flow backwards. And it's not just one or the other, it, it actually slows down. So as these get higher, this process slows down in a chemical reaction. So we also have this principle that we call activation energy. Um, if a reaction is going to occur, it will occur slowly until it passes through what we call a high energy transition state on the way. This is signified by activation energy. Basically, we have to take something, get it over a little hump, and then it's going to flow down much faster. Um, you could think of that as like getting that, that water wheel started. It takes a lot of energy to get it started, but once it's going, it's going to continue to move quite rapidly. Another way to think of this is a chemical reaction that you might be familiar with. Methane burning. So if you have a natural gas stove, you take CH4, which is methane, and that combines with oxygen. So if you just turn the stove on, a chemical reaction actually happens. The methane combines with oxygen in the air and some heat is made. But this happens at a very slow rate until we get over an activation energy hump. That is the igniter in your stove sparking. That adds energy to the reaction and pushes us over the hump and starts the reaction happening, burning, right? So burning is just a very quick chemical reaction. If you combine natural gas and oxygen, the reaction will happen, but just very, very slowly, too slowly to feel the heat from it. So here are our reactants, right? Methane, oxygen, we add a little energy, get them over the hump, here's our arrow, and our products are carbon dioxide, a little bit of water and energy is released. So if we looked at this as a graph, here are our reactants, right? They're at a certain energy level. They have a lot of what we call potential energy. That's energy stored in those bonds, those carbons attached to the hydrogens. Those bonds are going to store energy. We have to get over the energy hump before we can drop down and get to the products, which are at a lower energy state. That means we're going to release energy here, right? This difference here is releasing energy. Don't worry about the terms here, delta G or things like that. This is a, that's more chemistry side of things. So we need to get over this hump. In our previous example, the spark from our igniter added energy to get us over the hump 
and start the reaction going. In biology, we don't spark our cells or anything like that. We have a group of molecules that we call enzymes. These are things called catalysts, which basically lower the energy needed to start the reaction. So catalysts reduce this energy hump that we have to get over to start a reaction. In our cells, enzymes are pretty much always proteins. Um, and the enzyme doesn't actually participate in the reaction. It, it doesn't get used up. Um, it just helps lower this, uh, this hump. And it does that by some kind of complicated means. But you can think of it like basically bending molecules. Enzymes bend the reactants whatever we're putting in, into a shape that makes them more likely to have this reaction. So an enzyme here, it binds to its substrate, in this case sucrose, right? And it kind of bends it into a shape that allows a reaction to occur. In this case, we're breaking sucrose into two molecules, fructose and glucose. Uh, but the enzyme doesn't get used up. So it just stays here. It can go along and find another sucrose molecule but enzymes speed up reactions by making them more efficient. You can also affect reactions by temperature, but temperature also affects enzymes because enzymes are proteins. Enzymes work best at a specific temperature. In most cases, that is at, for us, body temperature. Um, if the temperature goes too high, proteins can go through something called denaturation. They can break down. This will happen to the proteins uh, in enzymes as well. So enzymes won't work and will actually get broken uh, if temperature goes too high. And you're probably familiar with denaturation because if you cook an egg, right, you have the egg white that is in there, it's liquid when it comes out of the egg, right? As you apply heat in the pan, the proteins that are in the egg white begin to denature, they break down and form into a solid mass. So you probably didn't know it, but you've been denaturing proteins for a long time if you eat eggs. Um, this can happen in your body as well. When your body has a severe fever, uh, you are trying to denature the enzymes in bacteria, right? You're turning up your internal thermostat to try to cook the proteins in bacteria. Unfortunately, if this goes too high, it will start to cook the proteins in your brain, and that's where you get the term fever dream, right? When you have a very severe fever, you often have strange dreams because you're literally cooking your brain. So past a certain temperature, we try to cool people down, but a little bit of fever is actually good to try and fight bacterial infections. Temperature can infect uh, chemical reactions as well. Uh, chemical reactions tend to work better at higher temperatures rather than lower temperatures. But um, as we see, if there's an enzyme involved, there's a certain limit on how high the temperature can go. We also have this uh, measure called pH. You're probably familiar with acidic and basic things. Um, if you've ever tasted a lemon, you know it is very acidic tasting. Uh, this is um, on the pH scale down here at pH of two. This is a measure of acid and base. How this happens, it has to do with hydrogen ions and things like that. We're not gonna get into the chemistry of it, um, but you should know that there are acids. They are lower on the pH scale. Uh, they can be damaging to biological membranes and things like that. Basic, right? Um, something like baking soda is actually slightly basic. Uh, but if you uh, have something like ammonia or bleach and you've ever got it on your fingers, you probably notice that it feels slippery. That's not the ammonia or the bleach. That's the fats and oils in your cells being broken down by the basic substance. That's what makes them a great cleaner, but that's why they're very bad or caustic to us. Um, so pH is a, a logarithmic scale of hydrogen ions. Don't worry about that too much. It just tells us how much acid or base is in a substance. Um, you can see some common things here. Um, water, pure water is pH seven, that is neutral. So lower is acidic, higher is basic. 
Uh, the pH in human blood is super tightly regulated and you can actually influence it by holding your breath. If you hold your breath, CO2 builds up in your blood and uh, that forms an acid that can actually impair brain function. So your body, if you hold your breath too long, recognizes this and makes you pass out and start breathing, right? Um, if you hyperventilate, breathing in and out real fast, uh, you lose CO2 too fast and the pH of the blood goes up into basic, which can ca also cause fainting and or seizures. So your body can sense this and uh, basically, if you try to be dumb, it, it prevents you from doing that to keep the chemistry highly regulated. Now, we're going to finish this section with something that's a little advanced. I want to introduce it, but we're going to come back to it when we talk about metabolism. Now, I talked about electrons being a kind of energy currency, let's say. And there's a set of uh, reactions that we call redox or oxidation reduction reactions uh, that involve moving an electron from one substance to another. So we start with compound A, which has two electrons here, uh, and we're going to move those electrons to compound B here. This would be reducing or gaining electrons here. So B is reduced. Oxidation refers to loss of electrons. So A has been oxidized. It's lost its electrons and given them to B, which is reduced now. This oxidation and reduction always happens together. And it's important because we can use this to transfer electrons from one substance to another, which is basically giving them energy. And we're going to use this in metabolism to drive chemical reactions in the body. So um, just know for now, reduction refers to gain of an electron. So gaining electrons is reduction and oxidation is a loss of electrons. Okay, so let's recap here. Life requires energy. I don't think that's any surprise. If an organism lacks a source of energy or can't transform energy, it will die. The concentration of reactants and products determines whether a reaction will go forward or backwards and how quickly it will do that. If you increase the reactants on the uphill side of the water wheel and decrease or decrease the, the um, concentration of the products, the thing on the outside, the reaction is going to go forward. If you increase the products and decrease the reactants, it's going to go backwards, right? So think of that water wheel example. Most of our biochemical reactions require catalysis by that enzyme. So the protein that reduces that activation energy hump. They lower the activation energy, making an, a reaction easier to happen, speeding it up, basically. And then reaction rates can be affected by temperature. Higher temperatures tend to make them go faster. But remember, if there's an enzyme involved, there's a certain point where it will get broken up or denatured. And then pHs. Um, some reactions happen better at different pHs. We're not gonna. There's no general rule. It depends on the reaction. Um, this is oftentimes because specific enzymes require specific pHs. So just know these can affect them, but uh, don't worry about by how much. Okay, that's it for this section.